thank you for being here this morning. Um, a few announcements. Uh, I'm going to try and get, it looks like we've achieved the money that we needed for uh, the additional money that, because it wasn't in the budget to do the one call system. Um, one call now is the company and the, the service that we've decided to use in order to send out uh, digital messages, voice messages to cell phones and landlines and in order to um, continue to communicate. One thing that we're going to do then is that um, all, once a week <clears throat> I'll send out a message, maybe a short promotional, and then a snippet, a snippet, I don't know if that's the right, snippet, snippet, snippet of, of what is happening throughout the week so you know what's going on and, and trying to communicate that way. It'll also be a great system for updates for when there's closures and things that we're going to cancel as we move forward. So keep that in mind, but what I wanted to see was because of that, um, we need people to update uh, your phone number that you want used for that. So if you, for an example, would prefer that to go to a cell phone instead of a landline, I need to know that. And so I didn't create a sign-up sheet. Maybe that would be the best way to do it is to have your name on the sign-up sheet in the back and you can just put on the, number that you, the numbers that you want used there. Um, we'll have 150 to start with. I think that, that would be more than enough for everybody who uh, needs to contact. But um, if you haven't updated your phone number in a while or, or that kind of thing, um, either call and, and have that done. But if, you, if it's updated and it's fine with what it is, you don't have to do anything, you don't have to worry about it. And so I'll be trying to get that started this next week, <clears throat> having that up and running and, and working. So. Uh, look forward to that message coming up here, or, and if there's any questions you have on that, feel free to contact me. Um, are there any other messages, or any other announcements, sorry, any other announcements that we made that I did not make? That's maybe a reminder for the capture the flag and cook-up tonight. Okay, so there, today there is capture the flag at 2.30. And family cookout. Is that? And then, so then, if you want to be a part of that, they need to contact you, Jordan. Uh, for capture the flag, but the cookouts kind of like bring their own picnic stuff. So. Okay. All right. So capture the flag. If you want to play it, if you're planning on coming, touch base with Jordan. What's that? Alcohol. 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 <laughs> if you're gonna go for the, uh, the family cookout, it's bring your own stuff as you cook out. So. We begin our service then this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, let us uh, have our opening hymn, uh, The Battle of the Hymn of the Republic, number 569. It will be in your hymnal and on the screen, and we will call our ushers to receive our morning tithes and offerings.
Lord Jesus, we thank you for this morning, for the freshness and the newness of your promises as the sun rises today. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would be present in this service. We ask, Lord God, that you would use these gifts for your glory and your honor. Bless both gift and giver, Lord Jesus, in your name, amen. Please be seated. So I've been here for two years now. Can you believe it? It went by fast, huh? As things had changed over the last couple of years, one of the things that we did change was that we used the same confession of sin now every week. And I just wanted to remind us this morning, the, the purpose for that was so that as we're reading, uh, we don't have to worry about what we're saying and uh, worrying that we're going to say something incorrectly, but as you've grown accustomed to those words, that can also mean that in your heart you just do it without actually being a part of it. But it also means that what you can do is as you focus in on it, and as you say it, you're able to confess not just with words, but with the heart. And so this morning I ask that you would do that as we confess our sins with the confession found in the bulletin and on the screen, that you would use this time with your heart to confess our sins together. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake, Grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If this be your sincere confession, and if with penitent hearts you earnestly desire the forgiveness of your sins for the sake of Jesus Christ, God, according to his promise, forgives you all your sins. And by the authority of God's word and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I can declare to you that God, through his grace, has forgiven all your sins. In the name of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. We'll call on the scripture reader at this time. Good morning. Good morning. Would you please bow with me for the, a prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another day, Lord, of your faithfulness to us. Uh, thank you for your love and for your mercy. Uh, we just, uh, Lord, we just want to lift up those that have lost loved ones, Lord. I just pray that you would uh, put your arms around them, Lord, and give them uh, strength, Lord, through the grieving process. Just pray that you would be with Pastor Steve this morning as he brings your word to us, Lord. Um, I just pray that the Holy Spirit would, would speak to each heart here. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand, if you are able, for reading of God's word? Scripture reading is from Ezekiel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. reading in Jesus' name. And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, 
to nations of rebels. Who have rebelled against me, they and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are imprudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And the epistle lesson is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of, these, of this man, I will boast. Not on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. Though if I should bo wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Would you please join with me in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, Light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
We'll call on the children at this time for the children's message. If you're new or visiting uh, with the children's message, what we do is we have one of the students is picked from the week before, and they bring with them one item, and I have no idea what it is, and we do a message on that one item. Did you bring? Ooh, is it on this beautiful purse? No? Is it on the glasses? Are they too small for me to wear? No, oh, almost, but not. What are sunglasses for? They're there to block out. Have you ever, but what happens if I wear them during the, the inside in the day? Does that seem weird? Yeah. If I wore these all day today and preached in these, would that be distracting? So we use these to protect our eyes, right? To protect our eyes. How do you suppose sunglasses that protect our eyes uh, equates or equals or somehow works together with what God does for us, what Christ has done for us? So he protects us from Satan? Absolutely, that's true, right? God does protect us. Does he protect us from everything, though? I mean, Job experienced a lot, and he was a righteous man, right? And yet there was a lot of things that happened to him. So just because we believe in Jesus doesn't mean we get an easy, uh, no trials, no troubles filled life. We still are going to have troubles and trials. So if our glasses protect our eyes from the sun so that we can see better, the, the Word of God does the same thing, doesn't it? How, now think about that. How does the Word of God act the same way? What does the Word of God protect? How does it protect me? Man, you guys, come up here. Go ahead, Levi, come up here. I'm going to use Levi as my, my guinea pig example. So whenever I look at... Levi like this. So I'm over here and I say to him, ooh, let's do it like this. Ooh, that's nice. So I'm over here and, and I go, Levi, you do not look good. Now I've said that to Levi. Now what does Levi need to do when he hears that? He needs to remember what the word of God has said and he filters what he sees and what he hears from other people and from himself with the truth. What is the truth about Levi if he believes in Christ? Which he does, right? Okay, so he believes in Christ. So then what is the truth? He's a child of God. Now is... a. Uh, what makes Levi who Levi is? Is it, is it this cool shirt? It, it's not the cool glasses, but the word of God does tell him what God says about him. And who we are, who Levi is in here, is not determined by what I see of him or what I think of him or what you think of him or what they think of him. It matters on what Christ declares him to be. Is that right? And that's what we all have to do. So in the same way, every day when we wake up and we put clothes on our body and we need to put on these cool glasses and remember what Christ claims about me. So what were some of the things from Ephesians that it says you are in Christ? Do you guys remember? Have a seat. Go ahead, Levi. Who turned in a sheet to me? What did it say? What did, what did it say? We're chosen. We're adopted. We're predestined. 
Christ loves us, right? There was a lot of things in there. Who are you? Are you a failure? Sometimes we feel that way, but that's not who we are because who we are is who Christ tells us we are. So how are you going to know who you are then? I'm losing you. I lost you guys fast. Anybody else notice that? All eyes on me, right here. Everybody, right here. If we need to know who we are, and the word tells us who we are, what do we need to know? <laughs> the word of God, right? So what do we need to learn, memorize, and read every day? Ooh, man, I, I was hoping for, was, that was good, but what, what is it? Isn't there a song about it? Man, how long has it been since you guys done this one? <laughs> Three weeks ago, huh? All right, who's going to lead it? We're going to do it really quick. Who's going to lead it? Sarah, who should lead it? I think one of your sons down there. What? Okay, James, come on up here. Can you lead us in the song? Okay, go ahead, do it. Ready, go. Good job. Thank you, James. All right. Good job, guys. Oh, nice try. Arms out. Arms together. Lord God, thank you for claiming who we are. Help us to know that by knowing you and knowing your word. Lord, may it not be that we are drowned out by what the world claims of us, what everybody else tells us, but that we remember who we are is who we are in you. In your holy and precious name, Jesus, amen. For that reason, by the way, what we're going to do is you get to bring it next week, Zeke, because you got up first. <laughs> All right. You guys can have a seat. Oh, okay. Levi, okay. Sounds good. All right, guys, have a seat.
The message text comes from the gospel text this week, which is Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. And uh, I'm encouraging everyone to get back to bringing their, their Bibles. And so um, from now on, I'll be preaching from my paper Bible. And for that reason, I guess uh, for the last two years, I was using the New American Standard. But the paper Bible that I use is actually New King James Version. So um, following along in, in whatever version you have, I encourage you to bring your Bibles with you. So now reading from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. And then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which he given them, that such a mighty work are performed by his hand? Is, not the carp is this not the carpenter's son of Mary, and the brother of James, Josie, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could not do mighty works there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people, and he healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages <clears throat> in a circuit, teaching. And he called the twelve to himself, and he began to send them out two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their, hand, in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two, to two, and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, In whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake off the dust of your feet as a testimony against them. Surely I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So they went out preaching that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for this place that we have to gather here. Thank you for hearts that long to obey. Thank you for ears that want to hear. We pray, Lord Jesus, that your word and spirit would work mightily now among us and that you would strengthen each soul. Lift the weary heart, O oh Lord. Comfort those who mourn. We have so much in the last few weeks, Lord, that we, we really need your hand. We need your spirit to work. We need to hear from you and your word, not from me. So Jesus, please, may I be silent and may you speak now. In your holy and precious name, amen. I found this, this week's section a little struggling. And part of it is because uh, just like last week, it seems like there's almost two different messages that could be preached from this section of scripture, and I'm not uh, taking the sections myself and, and planning them out. I'm going by what the pericope says, which it, what I typically use is uh, the Missouri Senate's three-year lectionary, so every three-year it changes. So um, next year we'll, we would go back to probably what I started with originally, because that would be the beginning of the third year that I've been here. Um, Anyway, I struggled with this verse, and, and mainly because of verses 5 and 6. Verses 5 and 6 are where most of everything is going to be centered on when we think about and what we talk about today. We just had this section last week. If you, if you weren't here last week and you didn't hear last week's message, that message came from chap, the end of chapter 5 there, and, and what we had was we had Jesus heals a, a daughter, the Jairus' daughter, who was dead. He raises her from the dead. And, and they come in to get him, and he, as he, he's traveling to the house, he gets stopped. He gets, uh, a woman touches his garment, and she is healed immediately. 
And so because of all of the crowd pressing in on him, and because of this moment of healing where he pauses, he doesn't make it to the house in time, and the woman dies. The, the little child dies. The woman who he healed had the problem for 12 years, and the girl he raised from the dead had been alive for 12 years. And so he heals her. So we have those moments. We have a moment where Christ was able to heal somebody, and, and he did nothing. He literally did nothing. The woman touched his garment, and Jesus felt the power leave his body, and she felt the power heal her, and she was healed. And he says to her, your faith has made you well. Uh, he didn't say something. He didn't create something. He didn't touch her. She touched him. And then, we, and then we also see a place where he heals somebody, he raises the girl from the dead, and, and that person can do nothing. She was dead. She couldn't resist, other than the fact that, I guess that's all she did was resist, because she was dead. A, a dead person can't really do anything but continue to die, right, and decay. And yet, he calls her and tells her to rise and to stand, and she lives. That even time is not a constraint for Christ. And now we see this where he enters his own hometown, right? Uh, imagine, you know, the music in the, in the background, right? The boys are back in town. Right? Jesus coming in. Woo! That's not what it was like. They're like, who is this guy? Is this not the carpenter? The carpenter. How, how is he teaching with such authority? Where is he getting the power to do these works? And as he goes about teaching in this circuit, normally he would be doing miraculous miracles. But here... It says in verse 5 and 6, he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Doesn't that seem odd? How many of you like being the problem? Anybody? When, you're, when you think of uh, if it's between you and your sibling that's the problem, which finger do you point to the most? Oh, yeah, it was me. It was me. I hear that all the time in my home. Who did that? Oh, me! Me, I'm the guy. When I go, oh, the kitchen looks great. Who did that? Oh, then I hear it, right? Oh, that was me. But when it's not, when we're the problem, we want to point to somebody else. Oh, they're the problem. One of the things that I want to say and preface as, as we go about this little bit of text here is that I'm not saying that in every case this is a cookie-cutter approach. In other words, when there's a problem and for some reason in your life you find that, that uh, maybe God doesn't answer a prayer, maybe you ask to be healed and you're not, M maybe... The thing isn't given that you thought you should be given. It doesn't mean that lack of faith is always the answer. But in this particular case, it was. So it's not universally true. I, I want to be careful because when, when somebody who has a a prosperity gospel approach, which is name it, claim it. You want the Ferrari? You pray for it, you name it, you claim it. If you have faith, then you'll receive it. The problem with that is that, I don't know about you guys, I will never receive it. And they're going, well, the reason you'll never receive it is because you don't have faith. Or it's because uh, I'm not wealthy enough to own a Ferrari. It could be that, right? It could be as simple as I don't have enough money for a Ferrari. Or it could be that I would rather have 
a super B. You know, there's a couple other chances too. So I want to be careful that we don't cookie cutter approach this to all of our situations. However, we cannot deny the fact that, that something is happening here in Jesus' hometown where their unbelief is the problem. The thing is, is that Jesus is never the problem. God is never the problem. Well, why does evil exist in the world? Well, the fact that evil exists is not God's fault. He didn't create evil. Is it evidence that God doesn't exist because bad things happen? No. You want to know something? Sometimes bad things happen because there's bad things that happen. Uh, is a storm evil? No, but I can tell you, it can do some terrible destruction, can it? But that doesn't mean it's evil. Well, why do bad things happen to good people? We ask that, right? We talk about this all the time. Well, sometimes it's because you're stupid. You made some stupid decisions. Isn't it about time that we start taking responsibility for our own, our own responsibility for the things that happen, right? My mom had just become a new Christian. I tell this story quite a bit. Mom had just become a new Christian. To my mom, her dogs are like her children. She loved them dearly. And she bred Australian shepherds. And her prized her favorite dog. Um, when they moved, they moved close to the interstate uh, in Colorado there. And the gate got left open to the yard. They'd only been there only a few days. So the dogs hadn't adjusted yet to living there. Gate was open. Dog got out, got on the interstate, and got run over and killed. My mom had just become a Christian. She, she hadn't been a Christian long, maybe within a year. And she called me up, and she was bawling. And I remember her saying, why did God let this happen? My response to her was, God had nothing to do with that. You left the gate open. That's what happened. We like to blame. We like to point the blame so that we're not the problem, so we don't have to take responsibility for our own actions. But when it comes to the sin problem you have, you are the problem, not Christ. Certainly, we are born sinful. None of us, number one, asked if we wanted to be born, right? Anybody here choose to be born? No. Did you guys get to choose your parents? No. Did you get to choose how you were raised? Not really. There are things that are out of our control that we didn't choose. But when it comes to our sin and what we do with our own actions, we are responsible for what we do. Verse 5, because it intrigued me so much, I decided that I wanted to... I don't always translate everything I preach from, but when I wonder about specific things within a text, I'll translate it. And so this is the roughest translation it, that as I went through and translated it, that it said, and I found something in the text that doesn't come out in the English a little bit, but is there, and it's a double negative. And when a double negative happens, it means that there's attention and emphasis is being brought to this. So this is, this is how it would read. Uh, in the roughest translation, and he was not able, not, and when it says not able, that's literally what it's talking about. He was not able. There was no ability there. Not able. Not like he decided. It was out of his control. That's how the word seems. He was not able 
There was not an ability for him. He's not able. In that place to do not any power. Was not able, not any power. That's pretty significant, don't you think, for Christ? The guy who just came from a place who didn't have to say or do anything for the woman to be healed, who looked at a dead, dying de corpse, a corpse decaying, and brought it to life. And in his hometown, he could not do any, not any, power, except to lay a hand on a few of the sick and heal them. That was their problem. Careful not to read that and say, well, that must be my problem. So what is the universal truth that I wanted you to hear from this? You, when it comes to sin, you are the problem. There is no doubt about that. And we ought to begin to take responsibility for our own actions. But this outstanding truth that we find here is that Jesus is not the problem. You ever fall asleep when the pastor's preaching? I love that. Don't raise your hand, right? Nobody. It happens sometimes, right? I felt so bad for one of the guys uh, that I, when I used to preach because at another church because he had to work third shift. And he would come to work or come to church following. And he would try so hard. But that poor guy, he would, he would doze. And it didn't matter how good of a speaker I was. It didn't matter how, how well I presented. It didn't matter the story. But boy, he fought. And you could see that he was fighting, you know, like, no! No! It happens. But when we can't pay attention to the Word of God being just read, and we get bored? It's not the problem with the word. It's not. Right? If, if we were to go, guess what, guys? For today, all we're doing for service is reading the word of God for one straight hour. Anybody be like, woo! Thank you. <laughs> okay, brownie points for you. It might be difficult, right? You know, the, the thing is, is that we're creating that in our society. We, we are creating the fact that we must be entertained. Test it. Go and watch the Andy Griffith show, right? Great storyline, clean, good comedy, Good, strong storyline. You should not have a problem watching that. But if you watch a lot of TV recently, and you go watch that, you're gonna, you almost feel like you're bored. Put it on one time for your children and see how long it takes them before they pick up a device. Have you ever gone back and watched some of the old movies from the 60s? Gone with the Wind. I, I can't even sit and watch that, personally. I'm like, man, I need a car jumping off a cliff. Fast and the Furious, this is a, a prime example. Fast and the Furious starts out, oh, cool car, tricks, fast racing, great. Everything was believable. You get to the end of the series, you have a, a car holding a semi on a chain uh, with a helicopter going around a corner defying all laws of physics, and we're all, yes! It held it. Completely impossible, but we're okay with it. As long as we're entertained. Right? We're okay to sit and watch a game and eat some, some wings. We're okay to go and sit at the lake for long periods of time. But, we, but sometimes we have a hard time just sitting and wanting to read our scripture. I'm not saying that life has to be all about that. But I'm telling you this. 
when there's a problem with it, it's not the Jesus. It's not the word of God. In James, chapter 1, it says this, and and I I refer back to this quite a bit. James is one of my favorite, favorite books. Blessed is a man who, from chapter 1, verse 12, blessed is a man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised those whom he love him. Verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. When there's a problem, even if it looks like, well, God, you allowed this to happen, The problem is not with God. The problem is not Christ. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Your sin problem is not even the devil made me do it. He tempted me. No. Your own desires. If we don't like the way our country is going, you better vote, right? If we don't like what our life looks like, then make a change. If you're struggling with self-worth because you look at your life and everything that you've worked for doesn't seem to add up and the value of what you find doesn't seem to be there, then stop putting your value in the wrong thing. It's time that you remember who you are in Christ. It's time to remember that believing in him is important. Does that mean that we do it perfectly? No. You you only need a little bit. And it's not complicated. Guys, belief in Christ is not rocket science. Okay? You don't need a master's. You don't, in order to read your Bible and to have belief... You don't need to be a seminary student. You know what you need? You need to open it and read it. That's it. Nothing else. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. Not the word of Steve Jensen, not the word of the elder, not the words of the congregation, not the words of your neighbor, your best friend, your mom or your dad, unless say those words are repeated, the word of God. We need to know the word of God and the word of God only. This is what defines us. This is what, when I say that God is not the problem, that we are the problem, we don't even get to have an excuse when we're unbelieving because you know what scripture says? We are without excuse. It literally says that. That in creation alone, We are without excuse. Furthermore, as we sit here and we realize, what does God expect of you? Perfection? No. Belief. That is it. Believe, trust, obey. Yeah, but it comes in that order. Believe, trust, obey. You don't get to obey, which brings around belief. It doesn't work like that. You know? What am I asking for from you this morning? What do I feel like Christ is asking from you this morning? I can't say for certain that the problems that are in your life will be resolved simply because you believe. 
But I can tell you this. When it comes to your relationship with Christ, most certainly Christ is not the problem. If you want something in your life, especially if it's from the list of the spiritual gifts, the gifts of the Spirit, you don't get those by your effort. You get those by the Spirit being present in your life. You get the presence of Spirit in your life when you believe. When you've accepted Him and you are born again, you are born in that Spirit, that Spirit is in you, that makes the difference. Does that mean it's a life of ease? No. But we also don't get to blame God for our stupid choices that we make. Today, let us make wise choices. Let us believe and trust and obey. Let us recognize that our belief can be a reason that God is hindered. It doesn't mean that's the only thing that has a problem in our life, but it is something that we can control. As we read the Word of God, faith is given. And as we have faith, we can believe. We can choose to follow Him. Let us do that. In your holy and precious name, Lord, we ask that you would come in such a mighty way that you would change our way of thinking, that you would help us to not just want to obey you, but that we would believe and trust first in the things that you've declared us to be. And that in those things we would rest, that we would move when you say move, that we would love you and love others in such a way that we are your hands and feet. So Lord, when we need to speak, speak for us. Use us to speak. May we not speak in the wrong place, but be wise and speak when you say speak. When you say hug, let us hug. When you say give, let us give. And always you say believe. Fear not, for I am with you. Maybe these things, Lord Jesus, that we stand on. And as we have gathered here, Lord God, now we prepare to come to your table, to the table that you've prepared, to the table that you have instituted, where you promise to feed us from your presence, to strengthen us in our belief, truly in our soul. May each and every one come and receive from you the gifts of grace, Lord Jesus, that we so desperately need in this hour. We pray these things by the power of your blood and in your name, Jesus. Amen. In the night in which Christ was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. He said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. In the same manner, he took the cup. And after he supped, he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and drink of it. This is the New Testament in my blood shed for you and for many. For the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it of all of you. And as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. The table has been prepared. The ushers will guide you forward. But as we begin here, let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. If you believe as we believe, and you are visiting today, if you believe that Christ is really present, we would love for you to come forward and have fellowship with us and with Christ around his table where we receive his body and his blood. Would you please rise to receive the benediction? Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely 
And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, and invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.